I'm pleased to welcome Vivek Bobart, the Senior Vice President Strategy, Global Customer Advisory at SAP. With over 25 years of experience in brand, corporate and technology marketing, Vivek has established himself as a global leader. At SAP, he has held various influential roles, driving growth and revenue objectives while collaborating with C-suite executives, customers and partners. A prolific writer and co-author of two influential business books, his work has been featured in renowned publications such as Harvard Business Review, MIT Technology Review and Financial Times. As an alumnus of Harvard Business School and Clemson University, Vivek has developed a cross-disciplinary mindset, combined with a passion for innovation, fueling his success in developing new market categories and strategies. His ideas on marketing, personal growth, and leadership have inspired audiences worldwide, and now, he's here. Hello everyone. Hi, I'm super delighted to be here, and it's really awfully tough to follow John, and I promise you I will not make you jump up in your seat. So, so in the next 10 minutes or so, what I'll try to give you is a little bit of a perspective on how a complicated B2B business sees the opportunity with AI. And just to you know, give you a sense of the type of businesses that we are talking about, I represent SAP. So very, it's some of you, many of you have heard about SAP. In fact, we have 1,400 people at the Sofia office within, within SAP, so we're quite well, well established here in Bulgaria. But realistically, we, we serve about 440,000 customers all around the world. We're in 180 countries, and we have about 110,000 employees. So we've been in business for over 50 years, and we've seen a lot of complicated aspects of business because we provide mission-critical businesses that makes all of these companies successful at what they do. So what I thought I'd share today was to give you a sense of looking at AI as an opportunity for solving some complicated aspects, particularly from a marketing and sales perspective. There's lots of other um, you know, aspects that we've looked at. I'm not a technologist, I'm not the expert on AI, but I can give you that context from a strategic point of view. Because I think somebody said very well once, once, once upon a time, which is when what you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So in this context, there are so many different things that you can solve, but what I'll try to give you is just three specific areas of opportunity where you can try to address and strategically look at where you can deploy AI from this perspective. So let's just take a quick look at you know, what a typical business-to-business -business engagement actually looks like today. Right? So basically what you have in this type of an environment is if you just look at the type of solution complexity, which is all of the different solutions that the business provides, and you look at the problem complexity on the customer side, what you see is that there are two extreme points in, on this chart. And what you see on the right-hand side on the top is there's a lot of very significant customers with lots of different problems. That's about 5% of the volume of all of the customers that a typical B2B company would serve. On the left-hand side, at the bottom left, you have a lot of different customers with one, some fairly simple problems that can be solved through technology. But most of the engagements really fall somewhere in the middle, and that's really where the complexity arises. What we've discovered now is, as companies have um, come out of COVID, is that there are three distinct patterns that have emerged in B2B selling and buying. Number one is, post-COVID and particularly in a cloud-dominated world, buyers are looking for more and more personalization. So all, we talked about personalization all day today, and in fact, that's very true, not just in the consumer space, but it's also true in the business-to-business -business space. And in fact, what's happened is, in the complicated buying, the number of people involved in a purchase has actually gone up. And all of these individuals involved in the purchase want personalization. The second big thing that has happened is, that there are, you know, in the past there used to be maybe seven to ten different touch points involved before somebody would say, I want to select this particular software, I want to implement this type of capability. Now the number of touch points has gone up to close to 50. And the number of channels of engagement, the way that companies and, and, and business um, representatives want to engage with a particular brand or a company, those channels have also exploded from six to ten channels. So there's been a lot of complexity that's been introduced into this mix, and what we basically are looking at from a strategic perspective 
is what are the big areas that we should look at in terms of deploying some of these capabilities that you've been listening to uh, today. And so I've broken it down into three big things. I'll go through each one of these. The first one is really looking at the entire end-to-end -end customer journey. And I'll go into that into a little more detail. The second one is really understanding that business-to-business -business buying is a complicated issue. It relies a lot on human expertise. So it's not like buying you know, toothpaste at a store. There's a lot of mission-critical products involved. Uh, if you make the wrong selection, for instance, the entire value of your business is at, is at stake. So the human expertise that's been in there, resident between the employees of the company, the partners, all of the people surrounding the products, very, very important. And then the third one, I think, is um, where we believe that we could come up with completely different ways of delivering experiences to, to individuals across these businesses as they move through their, their customer journey. <coughs> so let's just go through each one of these um, very quickly. So if you, if you were to imagine, let's say, a purchase of, let's say, a transportation module or a warehouse module, something like that, um, a typical company would have many different touch points, like, I, like I'm showing on the chart over here. So what we can do is that with AI, the insights that you can get from every one of those interactions can now go from a chart that looks something like on the right-hand side, which is super complicated, to a customer journey that gives you a really good sense of what is the type of pattern of buying associated for that particular individual. So all of a sudden, instead of having some very high-level segmentation, so for instance, a typical segmentation for a company would be based upon, let's say, size or geography or some kind of a prior buy buying behavior. Instead of just having maybe eight to 10 of those parameters, you could have a number of those parameters. You could have hundreds of parameters, so you could actually personalize every person's journey. So all of a sudden, you go from static customer journeys to dynamic customer journeys. And that's really what I would say is you move from more of an episodic uh, way of engaging with your customers to do much more of a dynamic way of engaging with your customers, and that usually involves process transformation. So the first step is process transformation. The second one, as I mentioned, is everybody wants personalized service. So once you un understand the deep insights from your customers, the second one is really looking at the expertise that you have in your people. I just did a very, very quick, quick sort of math, and I looked at just the resident expertise within our company, within SAP, for instance, 20,000 plus people, and I looked at the average experience of all of these individuals. If you just compute and do the math, that's roughly about a billion person hours of experience just within one set of the company. Now imagine if you could just assemble all of that knowledge and make that knowledge available instantly to every interaction, right? That's the opportunity here in terms of really moving from a resource capacity, the intellectual capacity that you might have, which you think is scarce, but you can move that from scarcity into abundance. So that's the second big aspect. And let me just go through the last one, which is um, the self-guided experiences that I talked about. So if you now know the buying criteria and the patterns and some of the things that are important to each individual that's involved in the sale, you've now created a customer journey around that. Now you can start bringing in lots of different types of technologies from a creative perspective, something like what John and some of the others have talked about. You can have hybrid you know, media, for instance. You can have virtualized experiences. You can do all kinds of different things in order to really provide experiential learning for, for most people. So I know that I have only two more minutes left, but I just want to give you sort of these three broad uh, brushes. One of the things that we also have seen is that in many cases, the B2C companies are probably at the forefront of using these types of technologies, and they've been doing it for, for a long time. The measure of success for many of these companies is net promoter score, which is a different metric now that business-to-business -business companies are going to have to go through. So there's, a, there's not just where do we deploy it, but the question then becomes how do we measure whether or not we are actually successful in terms of what we are doing. So the net promoter score, some of these other calculations are super important. Like, like you can see on the top, Tesla enjoys a fantastic net promoter score. 
On the other hand, an average B2B business has a, has a net proportion score of only about 20 to 40. So the measurement will also change. And from SAP's perspective, outside of the way that we're engaging with customers, we're also bringing technologies that can help many of our other customers with many of our partners. So um, there's lots of capabilities within our own um, tool sets. We're teaming up with Microsoft. We're teaming up with IBM. You can read about all of this stuff later. And what I will say is just to conclude that if I were to give you sort of some of the statements that you hear today, number one, there's resistance from those people who are in power. You're hearing that in the news. There are regulations that have been passed. All of these are good things, right? There's a lot of skepticism in terms of what is going to happen with this technology. We've had some discussions today on whether this is going to be a friend or the end of humanity. So we've talked about all of these different scenarios and whether or not we're going to really disrupt what we have taken to be truths that have been passed down. So do we now start getting into the situation in unorthodox ideas? Now, these were the things that aren't just specific to the discussion around AI as a new platform. This is the exact thing that was actually discussed when the Gutenberg press, the printing press, the portable printing press was introduced because it fundamentally changed the way that we would look at literacy, look at books, and the distribution of knowledge. So I just want to leave you on that note, and I want to say thank you for everybody's time, and I hope I've given you something to consider as you move through your own business. Okay.